Hi, everybody. Welcome again. Um, all right. So today is a popular topic, uh, pop music, and particularly exercises we can do to prepare for this kind of style. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. This one, I definitely encourage you to try along with me. I'm not going to be singing anything particularly high, although when we get to head voice, it's in a higher register, but it shouldn't be taxing on the voice. We'll talk about all of that. So yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, hey, I'm doing all right. Yeah. Um, just uh, started a meeting with my choir and we're getting ready for a concert, which is really exciting. I love uh, group singing in general is something I highly recommend for anybody. It's just a, a great way to re-inspire yourself and all of that. So yeah. Okay. Let's get into the topic. So we've got uh, pop music and what we need to do Let's take a moment and just think about like what is this style and what's hard about it. So when you, you know, if you're like planning a lesson plan for pop music, you might be like, okay, that seems pretty simple. I know what pop music is. And the more you think about it, the more you realize it's a little bit of everything. Uh, kind of what characterizes pop music is that it's constantly changing. We're constantly reevaluating and finding new popular methods. So some of it is that exploration. Um, there's definitely some things that we're gonna talk about that have been attributed to pop music, but it's always gonna change a little bit and it's always gonna have some hybrids of other styles. So pop music is nebulous. And I think that's important to point out. There's lots of different kinds of styles and ways that you can uh, create your own sort of pop, um, method right so we're going to talk about different choices here and there's sometimes a little bit opposite choices actually which can be kind of interesting so let's get diving into it so generally pop music has a couple things that we can compare to compared to like uh classical music so you know because i've I mentioned this before before i did belting uh classical music is more vibrato and more backspace hi welcome uh, pop music is kind of a little bit more towards the opposite, although again, there's lots of variations, but it tends to be a little more straight tone, a little more forward, and a lot of different stylistic choices in general, whereas sometimes we'll have a little more uniformity with like a classical sound, perhaps. But again, it's really hard to pin this down. I think you'll start to hear what I mean as we go over different exercises and different sort of methods. So. One of the first ones that's actually really great, that's kind of a little different from a lot of what you hear in classical style is kind of an opposite, is using vocal fry. So this is a great warm up actually to start with because vocal fry is kind of, it's pretty much the lowest register of our voice. It's pretty much like such relaxed support that you have little air bubbles escaping from your throat. We hear it a lot when we're talking, right? Like if I start talking with more fry, you start to hear this kind of sound. Um, if you're not able to access it, we're going to talk about some methods for that. Typically, if you've been if you've been singing or talking a lot, it's really hard to get to vocal fry if you're nervous sometimes because you need to relax and get a very very low level of activity in your belly and your back. So one thing I actually like to do is uh, obviously imitation. So try this with me, but think of doing the circle of vowels that I do in a lot of my practice, but do it with fry. So it's going to be like this. Um, yeah, yeah. You hear it kind of sounds like a creaking door. Um, again, that's little air bubbles like uh, coming out of the vocal folds. And my support's pretty relaxed. So again, I'll do the circle of vowels. I'll go through E, A, A, O, and U and try to keep that fry consistent as its own kind of distinct register. So it's like, yeah. You might notice that time I let a lot of air go first. That's just to make sure that I'm not so like over engaged that I can't get that sort of fry sound. Um, then, you know, if that's how, if you're having trouble with that, on, um, then try to sort of modify the energy. It's not quite, it's kind of pitch, but not quite where you go like, uh, uh, sounds very, very weird. I'll show you how this sort of applies to when we're singing. Because sometimes we want this sort of like nonchalant, sort of relaxed feeling in our uh, pop music style. So once you can get that fry activity, and then see if you can start to actually go in and out of fry and a pitch and go back and forth. So I'll pick this E flat here and I'm like, 
Do you see I'm kind of falling back into sort of this like stalling out kind of sound? And that's the fry. When you can come on and off of it like that, you can actually start to control it a little more. Now, ultimately, like I isolate these style things just to feel it out and get in my muscle memory. And then I let my natural sort of expression and imitation kind of take over. So it's not that you necessarily want to have a very concerted like, no, I'm doing fry because that doesn't quite play off the way that we want with a lot of stylistic choices. Um, so you can take an exercise and you can start going like this. You can use a glide, like a wah or a yaw, and try to scrape a little bit of that fry. So you might try scooping into the pitch. We're gonna talk about scoops in a second too. It just helps us get more of that relaxed feeling. So we're like, can you come back to it, right? So sometimes it's coming into it, it's hard to fall back into it. And you'll find as people are singing phrases, sometimes it comes in and out. Um, so you can play around with this with your talking. I know some people talk about this as like, oh, it's a bad habit to do fry. I disagree. I think that what comes with this is like, if you talk with the habit of fry, you might be used to a very low level of support all the time. So when you go to raise your voice, you might be more likely to cause strain. So it's if it's a habit, that's a problem. But if you use it intentionally, those little air bubbles and that ability to relax and come off of your voice a little bit can actually help you decompress and it can massage the vocal folds a little bit, get them a little frothy. So uh, it can actually be helpful. Again, as a habit, it can become a problem because you might be under supporting sometimes. So practice pulling it into your sound first by doing that circle of vowels thing like, yeah to get that feeling. Again, if, you're, if you've been singing a lot, it might be really hard to get to that level of relaxation. Take a nap, do some stretches, come back and try to do fry, especially when you wake up, it's a lot easier to access your vocal fry. And then try to just come on and off of the pitch. Like maybe I'll do the third this time. So. And then Some songs require that kind of vocal fry sound. Let's move on to the next thing. So in general, pop music, one thing that can be attributed to it is a more natural sort of speech-like sound, especially in like a lot of the verses. This is true for musical theater and some other things as well. Uh, accessing your less sort of sung sound is something that you'll see all over the web. Uh, you just want to sort of access your speaking voice and to think about speaking on pitch. Uh, so there's all sorts of really silly exercises for this to trick yourself into it. But you might do some exercises also on this third where you're thinking about sort of like calling across the room. So I think of like pitched singing and some energy in it as expanding how far away I'm thinking about reaching someone. But you want to, again, think less like, you know, oh, that's very sung. We're just going to go, hey there, hey there. You'll notice, right, my speaking voice is actually very sing-songy. Um, so it just depends on how your voice works. But start to think about just, hey there, kind of loosely getting to the target. Hey there. And as you go higher and higher, hey there. Think about farther and farther away. Hey there. Hey there. There's all sorts of silly ones, right? There's like, oh, no, you don't. Or, you know, this. You, anyways, you can just kind of go on and on. Uh, the point is just to think more like you're talking, which seems like it's an easy concept, but not necessarily for everybody. Uh, it depends, again, on what sort of side of the world you come from in terms of your voice. Um, if you're a more head voicey kind of light singer, it might be hard to just access a spoken sort of speech-like chest voice sound. Uh, so again, you'll find in a lot of verses in pop music, and I wish I could demonstrate some of these good examples, but you'll, you know, listen around and you'll see that a lot of it starts out kind of like talking. This is true for musical theater as well. It starts to go more into singing as we get more emotionally expressive. Uh, again, it just depends, but that's, that's something that you'll notice. So you can do these speech-like kinds of exercises. Um, I did like a third and a fifth, and I like using things like, hey there, hey you guys, or oh no, and same thing with Camille. 
Uh, and the reason is because it just starts to trigger kind of more speech-like sound. You'll even find sometimes, and this is sort of like an extra aside, that you'll actually get like actual talking and sort of like a microtonal. It's almost like half steps, but it, you're so you know, if I'm like, I'm talking and I'm singing and I'm going like that, you know, it'll sort of slowly drop down and things like that. It's again, it's sort of like starts to sound more like talking uh, and comes in and out of singing. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is we sometimes get a breathy tone uh, and sometimes we actually get the opposite, a very global sound. So again, you'll see that people with popular sound, they're experimenting with specific kind of unique expressions that eventually kind of get adopted into the, the genre of pop music as they continue to revolutionize it and get everyone's attention. So again, like pop music, what is it? Uh, pick your favorite artist and maybe you'll start to see some similarities, but again, there's a lot of variation involved in the genre as well. Um, so with a breathy tone, it doesn't have to be too much magic here. It's actually a pretty simple concept, but there's some things that you want to avoid. Um, so a breathy tone is not a whisper sound. When, when we start to think about whispering, we tend to actually squeeze all of these muscles here in our throat, and that's actually very bad. It gets us disconnected from our support. So thinking about breathy tone, think of using the sound H, the consonant H, it really is breath, but try to make sure that you actually stay engaged with your support, and then it's through that release of these abdominal muscles so what I'm talking about is something that a lot of you probably have seen with some of my exercises, which is fogging the mirror. It's different from trying to push air out like you're whispering. That's tension. Fogging a mirror is getting warm air. So it's slower air that's coming out. So if you think of going like this on an HA, like. You actually notice your abdominal muscles start to kind of engage. Uh, it's kind of like running downhill, right? You, you're just trying to make sure that it doesn't completely let go and you kind of like flip over yourself. But at the same time, we are purposefully letting some air go and we're using that big open space. Like, So this is a breathing exercise and always it's stepping stones. We get a sense of that feeling. And then you notice I'm doing a lot of like, hey, Hey, just use that same third, maybe like. Hey. So I'm trying to add some of that H sound. And again, it's not. Hey, that's going to create strain. It's a different feeling, actually. It's more from your support. And we're just letting go a little more compared to when we do like a th where it's extra engaged. So this actually goes hand in hand with fry sound, right? You can be like. Hey, a little bit of breath. The trick, just like with Fry, is it's hard to make sure you're actually singing the right pitch, right? Because you might hey, actually not support it enough, and it's a balance of forces, right? We want to support it enough to get the pitch, but we're actually, our vocal folds, when we think about an H, it starts, they start to relax and move apart a little more, and we get You'll notice breathier sounds. You can't hold phrases as long. It's sort of a trade-off that can sometimes happen. Um, the trick is now thinking about adding H's in to things where you're using consonants. So if I'm using my one of my typical like ma's or na's and being like ma ma, that's pretty sealed and um, very resonant. And I might think of like ma. I'm thinking of like M H H A, right? Ma. Ma. I'm trying to get a little bit of that white noise in the sound. So that's something you can explore um, when we're thinking of light mixing. We actually end up doing a little bit of that breathy tone too. So there's lots of pop singers who use a light mix as well. That's something that I've covered before. Um, so again, these are just simple, almost like stylized technique things that you can work on, right? Like fry and breathiness are part of our technique practice, but they can be used stylistically. Um, the other side is a glottal sound, which is sort of the opposite from a breathiness. Uh, so this, like, you know, I've, I've done a number of different ways to imitate this. Like, you know, you can say the word like apple or uh-oh, or those kinds of things where it stops for a sec. Um, you can also like imagine like you just got kind of like punched in the gun. You're like, uh, 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 uh. 
Um, it's kind of almost like a beatboxy sound, like uh, uh, uh. you can see it kind of drops a little bit and they're coming together a little more forcefully. Now you want to be careful with this because if you overdo this, obviously it can cause some damage, but you'll might you you'll find a lot of singers sometimes are gonna be like, uh, uh, and kind of have a little more of a strike. And that's some sometimes that quintessential sort of poppy sound. So explore what side of this world do you do you um, sort of fall on? And oftentimes it's sort of flicking between the two options to create some more emotional expression. So again, pop music is kind of like using all the tools and kind of breaking the rules in certain ways to create certain specific emotional expressions and sort of extreme contrast, actually, a lot of the time. So you'll find like the typical pop form, right, is like you've got like something more speech-like and relaxed in the verses, and all of a sudden it just like jumps into the stratosphere for the chorus, and you're super engaged and you're a little more belty and perhaps a little more strident and a little more compressed with the vocal folds. So that sort of transition creates this sort of dramatic climax that often is very impressive and wowing. Um, and see if you notice it in songs uh, that you like that are in the popular music genre. So the other thing that we can talk about, aside from these sort of more technical things, is uh, runs, scoops, falls, embellishments. And so we're going to start to go over a little bit of this. I know I've done it in in specific as like an actual lesson on its own, but a lot of pop music is going to use runs. They're going to use um, scooping and sliding around a little more. And this other thing, like ambiguous falls and ambiguous slide ups, sort of like lifts, if you want to call them. And so I'll, I'll go over each one and sort of a way to practice it. So scoops are simple. Think of like a simple scale degree, like one, two, one, instead of going like ma, 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 very specific, we're gonna go yeah, ma. We start on one and slide up to the other. Ma. And then the fall is that ability to just uh, release my support right to that other note. Um, these start to get more and more elaborate. You add three notes and five notes and you start to have these riffs that happen. So this feeling is kind of coming on your support gently, sometimes associated with breathiness and fry, like, yeah, and then relax. Hey, yeah. I use a lot of yeah and hey when I'm thinking about pop music because that's just something that happens a lot in uh, sort of the more expressive sides where there's, there aren't specific words. Um, so you can, again, you can do like a second or a third and be like, yeah, yeah. That's a bigger slide, right? Bigger scoop and a bigger fall. Yeah, why? Um, so these are scoops and falls and they're sort of like beginning tools for riffing. Um, the next thing you, I want to talk about is that am ambiguous fall and ambiguous slide up. So this, again, these are things that you can actually just kind of fiddle around with and practice and it doesn't have to be super high but just getting a sense of what it feels like. So this can be hard for some people. So an ambiguous fall isn't going to a specific note, like, hey, it's like, hey, hey. You'll find it a lot of phrases, right? Like singing and doing and a thing and hey, why? It kind of just falls into a little bit of a boomy sort of chest voice sound. And the opposite is going like, I'm talking and singing, yeah, hey. It's kind of just sliding up again, right? So. See, if you hear them in certain songs, right, we're just sort of ambiguous, like, uh, uh, right, it just kind of goes up, and I'm not really thinking about anywhere in particular. For some of you, that's actually really easy. For others, that actually can be very hard to get it to sound ambiguous, and if it's not ambiguous, it sounds a little weird or a little off on the song. So you'll notice this in certain tunes when I'm practicing it with students. Um, I, you know, you'll actually find that that's something that you have to slow down and actually practice, which is your ability to... Hold a no, and then completely let go. Yeah, right, I'm just releasing my support. So again, we're playing around with extremes in the voice. Um, the other one is, uh, uh, I'm actually going up a little bit into a, in a registration sort of change, and we're gonna talk about that as well in a second, but you'll find that that happens in a lot of things. Again, I'm trying to sort of go across genders here too, because uh, some of these styles are more particular for certain uh, for certain singers more than others, but it just it really depends. Again, there's a lot of crossover. So that's that. The next side is doing actual riffs, right? So if you're thinking about like, yeah, and I'm following way into the, one of those things, I want to hit that note 
on in the middle, right? Like, yeah, oh. And we talk about some different styles for this. Some of it is it's on the rebound of the support. The other thing is I'm actually doing a little bit of throat singing. So I'm think of like scooping each note for a sec is kind of a way I help people feel this. If you're like, hey, a little bit of a pulse, right? Almost a little bit of a glottal attack. So you'll start to see again why all these little pieces come together. Um, so I'm like, uh, 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 sometimes like that staccato. Uh, 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 hey, hey. You know, um, that's a really good question. It's easier and you'll find it's very common that people do it in just a descending pattern that doesn't that's not necessarily always true um it's something that I, I think it'd be fun to do a lesson on which is going up with your your riffs um it's just a little harder it takes a little more energy and it's ultimately again about agility and lightness and that feeling of kind of pulsing uh but yeah typically i'm kind of focusing on getting people into sort of running in these things and it's a lot harder to teach it moving up with riffs compared to moving down to get some of that lightness. So that's sort of why I kind of do it this way. But you'll actually find that a lot of like fall offs and end note riffs are often releasing at the ends of the phrases actually. Um, and when you get into a little more of like, like R and B and, and soul and some of those things, you get some of these really big riffs where you're kind of rising up and like, yeah, 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 yeah. You're like, duh. And they'll kind of go up and down and these kinds of things. Uh, it's in both, of course, but for now, focus on this sort of side of it, which is feeling this pulse out, kind of like you're stretching uh, an elastic band. You can scoop and slide into it and be like, yeah. And then as I release my support, yeah, I kind of, uh, kind of pulse them. Um, again, this is a really hard style if you're not comfortable with pitch accuracy yet too, because riffs require you to hit a lot of quick targets really, um, really accurately. So you might want to do staccato stuff and be like, ha, 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 ha. It's really, you know, it really um, exposes if you don't quite have the right amount of pressure. Ma, 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 ha, ha, ha. And then scooping, right? Ha, gets you a little bit of that glottal feeling. And then, yeah, uh. So that's just off of a third. That's kind of the most common riff. That's also why I do this is sort of like, what do you hear more times than not? When I'm like, ooh, that was a cool riff. What was it? And I go back and I figure out the scale. And I'm like, oh, here's three, two, one. Uh, and that's fine. Again, that doesn't mean that that's like bad. It's just the point is, is we really like that sound. I'll sometimes do a, very, a kind of like a diatonic exercise doing this from five, four, three, four, three, two, three, two, one, two, one, seven, one, just to practice this feeling. And again, break it up into pieces, into groups of three. If it's feeling hard, you can be like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then try to stitch it together. Yeah. Um, that's the first thing. Um, you can do this with pretty much every note in the scale. Um, you'll find a lot of diatonic runs as well. Uh, but typically, a lot of pop singers are also going to use a pentatonic scale. Pentatonic is a really great uh, way to riff because it's taking out a few of the notes in the scale and it better fits into a lot of situations without sounding weird. So if you're a pop singer, you're gonna to wanna to get really friendly with the pentatonic scale. You might think, oh, it's easier because there's two notes that are removed. You know, a normal scale is seven notes and repeats on the eighth. Uh, pentatonic scale is five notes. And it's like, oh, well, that makes it easier. It's hard because there are spaces and you have to keep track of the spaces. So sometimes when we select out notes, that doesn't necessarily mean it's easier. Um, but once you get the feeling of a pentatonic thing, it's it's a very addicting sort of pattern. So. And there's a reason why it happens all over the place. It's very comfortable. Uh, so th the idea here with the pentatonic is we do one, two, three. We skip four. We go to five, six, and we skip seven. And we go to eight. So we've got one, two, three, five, six, eight, six, five, three, two, one. Notice that three, two, one is in there, right? Um, so when we're practicing sort of a pentatonic thing, we'll get like, Five, three, two, one, yeah, whoa. And I'll start practicing off of a pen. 
pentatonic thing. Oh. Um, so you have to be mindful of the gaps, right? Oh. Right, I do staccato. Oh. A little bit of scooping to feel that slight pulsing in my throat. Right, a little bit of glottal, not too much. I compare this to like running your fingers down the tines of a comb, right? It's a little bit of resistance and then it slips to the next, and slips to the next. So it's always about lightness, right? If you're really digging into this, it's going to get stuck and kind of be like, oh, and kind of get too legato, right? So that's part of this is, oh, yeah. And it's a little bit of that pulsing thing. It feels really, really weird when you, uh, if you're doing it for the first time. But again, try to do lighter rather than trying to like, if you're frustrated, you might try to like really do it over and over again and it'll just keep smoothing out. This has happened to me before too. You know, especially as someone who sings classical music, if you're doing a lot of classical exercises and then you come to this, you might find it's kind of hard to get onto your sort of light riffy sound. Um, not always the case, but that's why I particularly practice this for pop music is to get that kind of light sort of pulsy feeling. So again, you see, we started with some technical things, right? Getting the glottal, the breathy, talking about fry, speech voice, chest sort of sound. Um, and then we start to kind of apply it to some of these sort of things, right? To make this kind of sound like a pop thing, right? I'm doing a little bit of a scoop, right? Yeah, yeah, whoa. And I'll just do lots of repetition like that, right? Make sure that I'm really hitting those pitches. So those are five note riffs. I did six, five, three, two, one. You could do, you know, like just what I did with this, where I was like five, four, three, four, three, two, uh, three, two, one, two, one, seven, one. You can do a similar kind of pattern off of the pentatonic. You'd be like eight, six, five, six, five, three, five, three, two, three, two, one. Whoa. And you can kind of start to do that. And you'll find actually that's something you'll hear a lot uh, in certain pop situations. And again, yes, you can go up with your riffs as well. Um, I just find it to be a little harder. So first feel it this way because you'll get a lot of that agility, and that feeling of letting go and sort of creating, a, a, again, a little bit of resistance as your body is decompressing and you're falling back down. A lot of pop music is about that effortless sort of steeziness that we get. So again, that vocal fry, a little bit of breathiness, some scooping and some sliding. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention with the speech stuff is that Whatever you're singing, whatever culture that you're um, you're in, pop music in general is about the dialect too, right? So it's going to be a little more slang-like. It's going to be uh, a little less pronounced. So that's another thing you might think is a separation, right? Like classical music often has more particular pronunciation, uh, and you in pop music you get things like running, singing fly in, you know, INGs are not running, singing, it starts to sound a little too pronounced. So in general, when in doubt, go for a little more of a, a relaxed kind of fall off on your words, and you don't have to pronounce them so much. So that actually kind of helps sometimes, especially as we get really uh, belty and higher up, we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, yeah, you actually, if you if it sounds a little weird to you, um, go back and 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 listen to this, you know, or just think about the, the way that you might speak this again, like in a sort of a slang way, running, you know, that's again, I'm not going to go running, running down the way, running down the way, you know, it's going to be a little more like neutral uh, and a little less pronounced. So that's something also that you might find if you're like, ooh, this sounds like a little off, check your diction a little bit, you know, and make sure that you're not overdoing it. So, and then again, it helps with technique. Um, so I mentioned belting, right? I did this last week. Um, ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. We'll get to belting in a second. I just want to answer this. What is agility really? And how do you apply it when singing? Yeah, this is a tricky concept. Agility involves multiple systems. Um, in some ways, when we are not supporting with our belly and our back, and these muscles are really involved, that can create a heaviness or a sluggishness, right? If our body has to, or jaw has to move around a lot as we do things, that's going to slow us down. So uh, agility comes from good technique, but in general, it's using a little more 
uh, resonance work, actually. So um, when I think of agility, I think of lightness. So again, a, a light mix is going to help you with agility. And you'll find, yeah, a lot of pop singers that you hear who are doing more riffs, you'll notice they're coming oftentimes off the voice a little bit in order to do the riff. And they're just getting a little delicate with their sound. Now, this doesn't mean completely under support. So if you think about like, what is agility with sports in general, right? Like I think of like the shuttle run, right? Where you're like running across and trying to grab something and change directions really quickly. So that has a lot to do with agility. There's force in agility, right? You know, when you like run to grab it, you kind of have to like stick into it and push off of it. So this is this concept of like the rubber band thing. I'm leaning into certain things and then allowing it to sort of spring back and using that as agility. So by support conditioning, you find more agility, as long as you're doing it in a dynamic way and you're not over muscling, right? If we think of a lot of strength and a lot of pushing, um, that's going to slow us down as well. So it's a balance of forces, right? And it's actually kind of a complicated topic to discuss, right? What is vocal agility? In general, the voice is kind of a slow instrument compared to some other things because it has to connect with our breath and all these things, um, unless we're doing one of those things where we're decompressing and allowing the breath to just relax and falling down on it. We can get really fast that way. That's why I kind of teach that. Uh, but typically like a violin or some of these other instruments, like a flute, you're just able to like yeah, da, 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 do so many different things. And the voice takes some work and some stamina to do that. Um, you might try exercise, like here's a fun one with breath, um, just to kind of expose this. So doing that pulsing thing, think about it as like short little giggles uh, and like go like this, where you're like, <laughs> seems really silly, right? But I'm down here, I'm like, it's actually kind of hard to pulse it like that. So like, I know when I'm like, uh, my teacher for classical stuff when I, you know, I know I'm not supposed to talk about classical stuff right now, but like uh, when we're doing like lots of those like Bach kind of ornamentations with like, ha, 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 you know, if I think of like this sort of like little giggle kind of pulse in the belly that helps to kind of create that. So um, yeah, hopefully that gives you some idea of it. It sounds like we need to do that topic a little more too, right? Do riffs and runs part two at, you know, do things going up and talk a little more about agility. Uh, but anyways, there's a lot of agility in pop music in general, um, showiness, right? That's, it's just something that, uh, you know, it creates added emotion too, right? Like, so there's two options, right? Someone who's just using riffs all over the place, that can be cool, but ultimately it kind of doesn't necessarily serve the music or your expression, but riffs often show up when they're really effective. They show up when there's extra energy uh, and you're trying to create a change in sound and a change in emotion. So again, that's sort of that like contrasting thing that happens with pop music where it's like chill and very accessible, speech-like, and then it goes up into this big sort of like belty moment leading to belting, right? So belting is definitely something that's involved with pop music. It's maybe not as involved as people would think like uh, compared to like musical theater or, uh, rock music in general has a lot of belting in it um but certainly it is involved with pop music but i wanted to kind of show that it's this contrast of forces a lot of the time again depends on the singer uh so belting just a little bit of a review of last week um yeah yeah, yeah okay yeah, yeah um I, I love these questions <laughs> we'll get to belting in a second i did it last week so let's this see you saying um what approach should I take when warming up for a female artist song as a male? Yeah, uh-huh. Um, we're going to get to this, and we're going to talk about registration stuff. Uh, one thing, and this is also an, another topic that I need to cover, which is how to find the right key for a song for you. Um, and so I'll just go into this a little bit, but again, it's a whole topic. Uh, a big part of this is knowing where your range is. And knowing your range is thinking about like energy that makes sense. So if you're singing a female song in a key as a male and it's really high it might be like too much energy for that kind of relaxed sound that we're going for so you want to find a place where like let's say the verses are supposed to sound very relaxed and chill where you can actually do that in your range um depends like i sing also all the time like in uh sort of female keys as i'm demonstrating things that just comes with experience with head voice and mixing so that's a big part of that but ultimately, like I, most of the time with my students, I'm like, okay, you're doing, you want to cover this female song. Let's find a key that's more comfortable uh, and go from there. 
it still may involve jumping into head voice and, and such, because a lot of times a lot of female singers will be doing a lot more mixing than a lot of male singers. Although that's changing, and especially in pop music, you hear a lot of stuff uh, in head voice and mix. And we're going to talk about that in a second. So um, finally, <laughs> I'll get to belting, right? Uh, it's really a simple concept. When we're belting, it is a little bit of a mixed thing. We're going between, it's sort of where our chest voice is getting very high and we're overlapping with head voice. We want to make sure that we don't get completely out this way, even though it is a forward sound. Um, yes, yes, The weekend is a very good example of always and often singing in a mix and doing a lot of belting. And you'll notice that the sound can get very small, right? Actually, it's not necessarily always about having this really big sound. And that's a really good example of when someone is mixing appropriately. Absolutely. Um, it's hard and it takes some time to find that sort of placement. But that's, you know, oftentimes, right, the weekend is singing in ranges that are similar to a lot of female artists as well, you know, up in this, up in these high A's and C's and, and D's and things like that. So this whole area. Yeah. So good, good, good. Um, so belting has a lot to do with forward angled resonance. So I like to use ma and na and these things, but we want to just be careful that it doesn't pull out of alignment because that's going to help. What's going to do when it pulls out of alignment is we lose some of that higher, higher partials of resonance from the vocal tract. It's all kinked and out of alignment. And that's where we get a lot of force and a lot of um, fatigue and stuff. So again, I always like belting is one of those fun things everyone wants to get into, but you as it's always a caveat of like, if you're not used to it, wait, because it's you, you, if you're lifting the 100 pound weight and you're not thinking about chest voice and working on some of these other slightly more beginner techniques, then you're more likely to hurt yourself. So if you're feeling pain and you're straining, um, you need to go back and work on support and do some other things to condition your voice before you start doing the heavy lifting. Um, so with this simple things, right? Like no, 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 using like an N, right? And it's more about the perception of resonance, right? The resonance feels like it's moving this way towards the mask, as opposed to like, yeah, coming out of the back of my head, right? No, no, no. So people think of it as like a little brighter, a little more two dimensional, a little like kind of like sheet of metal, like kind of sound works really well with a lot of auto tuning or, or sounds like that kind of fits into that genre and style. So I'll do this kind of stuff, right? Like, no, no, no. Mindful of trying to relax. Um, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. You're, you're so, you're totally right there as well. Um, Aretha Franklin, anyone who's, uh, and often most female singers are doing a lot of mixing a lot of the time, not always the case, but generally it's more involved. Um, again, it's changed. Things are changing, but that's just something you'll see with like artists throughout, you know, the last like 50 or so years. And, um, yeah, so I'm doing this kind of thing, right. I'll work on sustains to help condition like, no, 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 no. Trying to keep it generally a little more straight tone, although we'd still hear vibrato definitely in pop music. Um, this isn't chest voice, right? I'm not quite getting up into my belty range yet, but I work on strength there, getting the right angle, making sure I have good support connection. If you're no, 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 and you're coming out like that, it means you're not engaging enough in your belly and your back. Belting is all about going from that belt, right? Right from your, your belly button and feeling that engagement there. Um, so yeah. We do that. We think about um, light mixing, right? So we're going like, that helps us feel the vocal tract and make sure that we're in the right alignment. And then, you know, again, this is all review from last week. And then I do stuff like this where I'm like, why, why, why? And the why, it's helping me get a little more of a megaphone sound, but prepare it with a little bit of that ooh, again, to make sure that I'm lined up and that um, I have more of that sort of sound. Instead of wah, yeah, right, that's gonna be too much. Wah, and the eventually wah kind of lands like that, right? It's gonna be a little more spread. So I'll do that kind of thing. And I, I like to kind of go up through the register like that. So on an arpeggiation, 
Why, 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 why? Again, I'm not trying to sacrifice too much alignment, knowing that, yeah, there's a little bit that's going on, but generally actually just trying to keep it in check. With most sort of like extreme singing, it's more about balance and making sure that you know, if I'm pushing forward, that I'm appropriately balancing it with some of those other sensations. So again, that was a very fast review of belting. Uh, it's definitely involved and you're going to get into these, you know, higher sort of chest voicey moments in your choruses a lot of the time. So let's move on though, because the next thing, and I think this is actually really important. There's a lot of this happening is talking about abrupt registration shifting. You're starting to see a pattern, right? Like pop music is about extreme contrast. Actually, a lot of the time was when I was really trying to think about like, what is the overarching theme that we see, at least as of now, there's a lot of contrast and playing with the technique. So um, an exercise for this abrupt registration is when I'm in chest voice and I really quickly switch smooth first. We'll talk about cracking in a second. Um, so I might do something like this where I go, na, 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 nu, na. So you see chest here and then, ooh, ah, and then head voice up on the top. All right, if you're not used to head voice, this is going to be really hard because I'm sort of skipping over that as a prerequisite a little bit. So I'm using ah, which is more chest voice friendly, and ooh, which is more head voice friendly. No, no. And I'm jumping an octave. Um, you could do bigger intervals than this, but that this pretty much does the trick. So I'm playing around with this. No, 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 no. You notice when I do the ooh, I have to be very mindful of stacking and making sure that I have good alignment. Um, no, 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 no. So you'll find this sort of popping up sometimes that'll happen. That's a great way to prepare for it. Eventually you can just, uh, ooh, uh, ooh, uh, and I'm just trying to kind of pop back and forth. So that's that practice. Um, that'll help you if you're trying to do a lot of female artists is your ability to kind of jump into that and have a more full head voice, especially as a male singer, you're going to want to make sure you work on some things where you're like, getting a little more chord uh, compression in your head voice and actually a lot of support so when i talk about head voice it sounds light so we tend to under support it we tend to get too breathy we have to balance that force make sure that we have some support underneath it our belly and our back is definitely engaged and it's harder the wider the vowel gets. So I start with E, then I go to A, and then I go to A. Ah. And A ah can take some time to really feel like you're filling it out. Um, so, and that's true for both genders in general. So anyways, that's some abrupt registration stuff. There's lots of little exercises and mixing in general really helps with this. Uh, the next concept is cracking or yodeling. And I think it's really important to kind of distinguish two different directions with this. Cracking up and cracking down. Now, some people are afraid of cracking, especially in like classical music. People are like, oh no, I cracked and like that kind of thing. Own your crack because ultimately you can use it as a stylistic element. I think I've heard it sometimes in some classical moments for emotion, right? Like the voice breaking a little bit. Now, controlled cracking is light and it doesn't hurt. It's really, really um, uh, gentle. And so if you're cracking because you're squeezing, 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 and then it has to pop up, that's a little too much, right? So if there's sometimes there's cracking because of vocal fatigue uh, and then there's cracking in a controlled stylistic way, right? A lot of these style things, if you overdo them, they become technical issues because again, you're sort of playing with, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, that's a really good example. I love this. You know, again, you're going to start to see this in all the stuff that you do. Um, it can be a very distinctive style to have some extra cracking in it. So uh, cracking up, think of similar to what I did with na, 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 nu. I'm going to do a, e. And I'm going to purposefully sing into that diphthong. I'm going to, um, I, I forgot to explain. Uh, cracking is when you push really into one register and then kind of, it's it's like extra abrupt transition of, of registration. Uh, and your body will actually kind of move there uh, on its own. So it's, you like lean into your chest voice a little bit. And then you really quickly think about, jumping into, up into head voice as you're sort of contracting and you'll get this sound. It sounds a little advanced, but it's really not that hard to do. Um, it's yodeling. But if I go like, hey, hey, you see, I'm kind of leaning into my support. Hey, ah, ooh, hey. And 
it'll eventually kind of realign, uh, kind of trips over itself and then goes up into head voice. So um, I'm using a fourth right here. Hey, hey. And then I'm getting that little flip over. Um, you could actually practice this and do fourths and then try to actually aim your crack to a specific spot. So it's like, hey. And then maybe I'll do a fifth. Hey. And then a sixth. Hey. And you could actually be really specific about where you're going to crack to. And that's a lot of songs actually will use that as a, an emotional ex expression, right? You're singing in your A. Oh. And that's an abrupt registration, right? So I'm going deeper into that. And you notice it's light, right? It's not, that's not hurting me at all. Um, so that's one thing that's going from chest voice and sort of bailing up into head voice. You have to just practice it a little bit. And these are exercises. This is kind of my point is you can sit here and play around and fiddle with these sort of sounds, map it out on the piano a little bit, and then see how it directly applies to your songs. You know, ultimately like, oh, I hear it right there. I know now have a feeling for that. And I'm just going to say, okay, do that feeling. Yes, there's technical reasons, but I'm just trying to get into my muscle memory. Um, so that's one thing. The other one that's actually very common is cracking into chest voice. And sometimes this it's missed. And I think when I started slowing this down, I started to really hear what was happening. It's head voice into chest voice. So if I'm like, oh, yeah. If you really hear it and I'm slowing it down, I'm like, oh, you have to, oh. It goes from head voice into chest voice. Um, so, oh, yeah right those are the kinds of things that we'll hear sometimes um that's again it's cracking down into it it's a really fun thing to practice it's not too hard you'll just ah, you're singing low head voice and so uh in that case like low head voice doesn't need that much energy to exist it's just like ah, ah, right i'm just doing that and then it, if i Oh, and I push into it too hard, right? You can hear it start the pressing and stuff like that. So I'm particularly doing a low head voice and leaning into it until it turns into chest voice. Oh, never more than that, right? So yeah, right. You'll hear that all the time, right? That's the sort of cracking into chest voice versus cracking into head voice, right? Which is hey, hey, like that, right? So. Um, you practice this at home and people are like, what the heck are you doing? That's totally crazy. But it actually sounds so good when you put it in just the right moment. So again, we're playing around with our voice. We're doing things that are shocking, that are interesting for emotional expression. And I think a lot of that experimentation is, is in the vein of pop music, which is continually adapting and finding hybrids and finding things that are new and fresh. Um, so that's that. Um, the last topic, and this, you know, it's funny, like I'm always like, how am I going to fill up a full hour on, on pop stuff? And it's always like, whoa, there's like a lot of material actually when you start to really um, take apart all the things that you're hearing uh, and try it with your voice. So the other one that I haven't uh, talked about is twang. And I know people, um, <laughs> yeah, 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 very cool. Yeah, um, so twang um, in general, we're using a little bit of our tongue to create an extra boost of resonance. It's kind of like overtone singing. Um, you know, these are old styles like throat singing and overtone singing. Um, this, you'll hear like the, you know, I know people are listing out names of famous artists, like Shakira does the backwards kind of version of this. And then you'll hear a lot of country people do the sort of front version of this. Um, so if the tongue is pulling back a little bit, we can create, it's sort of like an R sound. Again, these are techniques that sometimes if we do too much, they become technique problems that you have. So you have to be careful with it. It's always lighter than you think. And you want to make sure that you first have control over your basic technique. This is why I kind of separate technique and style a little bit, because you want to find the middle of the voice and your ability to isolate the muscles before you uh, start to play with it like this. So this is like thinking like, ear, hi, welcome. Um, er, the tongue, er, kind of pulling back a little bit. So it's like, um, you're in, you're in my head. You'll get a little bit of that kind of, kind of sound. Um, you can actually boost overtones that way. So if I overtone sing, I'm like, you're, 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 
it's a thing, but ultimately um, we're doing a little bit of that in certain sounds like the R's a lot of the time. You're, you're in my head, you're in my, right? It's like er, kind of thing. It's often accompanied with a little bit of cracking. Um, I always talk about the tongue as the gatekeeper of resonance. So when it's tight, it sometimes blocks that um, sort of transition. So a loose, flexible tongue, we're able to find that light mixing. When we create a little bit of tension, it can create a little bit of resistance that makes it so that our voice has to kind of slip from one to the other side. Um, and so that's the sound. We're using a little bit of it kind of to force some resonance. And it's a little bit of a forced resonance concept. It's like, and again, it's the tongue kind of pulling back. The other, um, so it's a weird exercise. All you have to do is think about like, ear, ear, going from an E to an R and rounding over a little bit. And you add a little bit of support and you'll start to hear some of that resonance. So that's a trick um, to boost things. It creates a certain kind of um, swallowed sound that actually can be really cool. Uh, it just depends on how you're using it and in what context. The other one is forward twang. I've talked about this. Is the tongue coming forward uh, into the sort of hard palate a little bit more than you'd be used to. So it's different from like, yaw, 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 where the tongue is up and down. That is boosting resonance. It's pretty similar, to be honest. Uh, but if I go, yaw, 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 I get a little more nasal twang. Any tongue thing is going to create a little nasality. But this one in particular, yaw, yaw, yaw. Again, it, you might think, oh, I don't like nasality, but you'll listen to some, some famous songs and you realize there's actually a fair amount of nasality. It's our ability to come in and out of it for particular reasons, to kind of sing into an N or um, really kind of lean into that. And that does create a boost of, of resonance in the overtone. So I'm doing nya, nya. It's an N-E together. Nya. Nya, nya, nya. That sort of sound. Um, and you can get, you'll start to feel a little bit of that. The tongue is very forward. Um, there's some famous singers who also do this kind of thing, especially in the more country kind of pop sort of realm. And you'll hear it in the nose a little bit more. So play around with these things. See if you can find a unique style of your own. So, you know, I might be tempted to say, this is what pop music is. But again, that's sort of wrong. All we can do is just look at what we've seen in the past and what has kind of become a slightly distinct genre, but just know that the genre is defined by its continually evolving nature. Um, so tongue coming forward, twang, tongue coming back, we get a little more um, of that sort of back throaty kind of twang sound. Um, uh, I, I'm having trouble understanding why is music singing so wonderfully completed? Um, Hey, Gary. Hi. Welcome. Yeah, well, you can always go back and listen to all of this. I know you're getting to the, this is sort of the end of the, the class. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not quite entirely sure what you mean by uh, why is music slash singing so wonderfully completed? Maybe you're, maybe the question is like, it's actually a pretty well understood theory in some ways, uh, at least music theory is. Um, we've taken all the way from like pattern to the absence of pattern and back. In fact, I'm going to have a whole thing on music theory. Um, but, you know, the voice is, uh, it's a really cool, complex system, and it's a, kind of a way to learn your body. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, st I'm still a little confused about that, but, like, uh, it's okay. Um, anyways, yeah. So the, the point being is, like, style is continually evolving, right? So pop music is continually evolving. The, one of the biggest things you can do is use your ears listen to your famous artists that are popular right now and try to you know pay attention to what kind of choices of style do you hear it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what you want to do with your voice but you'll hear a lot of these things right vocal fry slightly more speech sound a little more breathiness scoops falls runs belting abrupt registration oh complicated okay <laughs> got you sorry it's like the autocorrect thing um yeah you know, it's a good question. It's, you know, the more, the deeper you go, the deeper you go. It's complicated and it's also simple. Um, and, you know, my job is to kind of break it down a little bit so that we can have some stepping stones. But a lot of times we do this by feeling. Um, it's just, I think we're talking about 
our body. And so when we're talking about using our body to do stuff, there's an amazing amount of complexity involved. And yes, the voice uses the full body, right? There's all, you know, different systems involved. And I think that makes for some complexity. So it's kind of like a systems theory kind of a thing. Like how does my support influence the resonance up here? And um, it also has to do a lot with perception and these kinds of things. So that's, it's why you can just, you know, you, the deeper you go, you go. Uh, but my point again with this practice is we play around with these things. You know, sometimes we can nerd out about the physiology and all and how like acoustics work and like physics and all of these things, right? But ultimately it's a feeling-based art form. So you go through these exercises, you feel it out and you allow your body to do most of the work. So I, you know, I always say like when I'm, you know, the saving grace of this vocal practice, when it seems like, oh my God, there's so many things to keep track of is that our bodies are like supercomputers and they, the muscle memory will happen over time. Uh, and it's just about exploring and finding ease and efficiency. And yeah, there are certain types of patterns and shapes that help us feel that out faster. And that's a big part of my practice. And then when we go to sing, we try to just make, see it ha if it happens without us having to be overly intentional about it, right? So it's that conscious subconscious kind of hybrid. You know, it's a really funny question, like what's going on inside the mind of a singer as they're singing? It's, I've asked myself this as I do it, and it's, it's really hard to parcel out actually, right? It's a little like nebulous. And I think that's just the nature of perception and trying to get your body to do anything. You know, you talk about like athletes and like what happens when they're in the zone and um, the physiology of why someone is doing something really well. And you'll, you know, see similar things, right? It gets really complex actually, but that doesn't mean that you have to like obsess over that. You know, I, I think it's really cool. That's why I'm excited about it. But ultimately, like you, you can feel these things and find them without knowing that stuff. Um, it's mainly just about making sure that you uh, aren't feeling pain, that you're finding that ease and efficiency and you're guiding your body in that direction. So sometimes in our practice, we get frustrated and we start pushing harder and that leads to some injury, right? Just like any athlete. So it's knowing how to condition your voice and then when to stop, when to like set it aside sleep on it, let your body process, and then come back to it. Um, yeah, it does, you know, and it, the, again, this is what's so cool. I, I love spending the last few minutes of a, of a topic just sort of like pontificating, philosophizing a little bit about all of this. And yes, yeah, singing is, uh, you know, I talk about it as a wellness activity, and I think it is a perception activity. It expands your awareness of the space around you, of your body, um, sort of like echolocation. You'll feel certain tension points a little more. You'll feel the energy level in your body a little more sometimes. And so I um, I think that's a really profound experience of it. You know, you can hear people's emotions more too, right? When your voice is free and open, I really, I think it creates that kind of window where you, um, you surprise yourself with certain expressions that happen. Um, and, you know, a good singer is singing a room right? They're singing into the whole space and the vibrations are coming back to them and informing them. And uh, it's a great lesson in perception. And then when you're singing with others, then you're becoming aware of the sounds that are, you know, uh, kind of moving back and forth between different people and how you're working together or not or fighting the sound. And um, that can be a really, really great experience. Like, you know, again, like choir music is so much about uh, awareness and perception and listening and uh, it helps you sing better too. So when you start sort of synergizing with people. So uh, yeah, anyways, I know I kind of <laughs> went off topic, but yeah, pop music, it's a really, really fun thing to practice in general. I think people overly obsess on the belting aspect and there's so many other cool little stylistic things that can happen. And just be careful not to run away with your style or let your style run away with you. You know, Go back to your regular vocal practice as well but yeah, if you're going to sing a very poppy thing, I recommend doing some of these things, incorporating them into your routine, getting it primed in your body first. That's my whole concept with like extra warm up exercises. And then I just sing the song and I listen to the artist and I imitate and I allow my voice to be flexible. And that's, that's how it happens. And then before you know it, you know, record yourself and be like, oh, that sounds pretty poppy, you know? So again, you can go through this almost as like a checklist. If like, ooh, it's sounding like you know, people are telling me it just doesn't quite, it sounds a little off stylistically, go through some of these things and be like, what, 
what is it in particular that I'm doing? Like, am I over enunciating? Is there too much vibrato? Um, all of these kinds of things. So, oh, you're very welcome. Uh, you know, it's always so fun. Like there's, there's so much to talk about. And again, don't be overwhelmed with that. Like I, you know, my thing is to keep people thinking and to throw out a lot of different information for different people. Um, again, I do a lot of stuff in, generally in the lower register, uh, but you'll find with a lot of this pop music, right? It can, it can go up there as well. And you'll find a lot of these famous singers who are guys singing up in the mezzo -y sort of range, definitely. So um, yeah, very cool. Uh, I've got a whole new batch of other uh, things coming your way. So we'll just, uh, we'll see what happens next, next week. I think we, uh, someone mentioned head voice stuff. So we're going to do some troubleshooting with head voice sound. Um, and, you know, that'll help you with the pop voice singing stuff. So if you're feeling like that last bit, like the abrupt registration and the cracking is really hard, uh, you have to find some release and some strength in your head voice. And we'll talk about that again. It's, it's a hard style if you're not used, you know, we don't speak in our head voice very often. Uh, and so that means that those muscles just take some time to develop. And so again, be patient. It's never about force. It's about exploration and consistency. And that's going to be that. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I'll put that one in the books too. Um, you know, there's definitely a lot of crossover, right? And all of these things, that's part of what I'm trying to show is like how one bit of the technique can be adapted to turn into sort of a more of a stylized thing. The deeper you go down that, the more you become like distinctly in that sort of style. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very, very good. Yeah. There's so there's lots of crossover. It just, you know, so you'll find like pop RB, pop classical, right? <laughs> That's an interesting hybrid. Um, pop country, pop, yeah, well, you name it, it exists. So very cool. I will catch you guys next time. Always a pleasure and enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Take care, everyone.